I'm Joe, the Communication Officer for FEMS, and I'm joined today by Professor Graham Walker from MIT. And we're here in the um, Mediterranean Institute for Life Sciences at the FEMS Summer School for Postdocs. And uh, this morning you gave a lecture to the postdocs. So do you mind just giving me a brief overview of what you're discussing? Well, since this conference is on bacterial stress, and I and also my co-director, Miro Radman, did a lot of the early work on what's now known as the SOS response of E. coli. So rather, I tried to sort of tell students who didn't know everything about it something about the system, but not by giving a model and telling them where it was. I tried to do it in a way that was more historical as I experienced it, who had done what in the early beginnings of the field. And then once I got into it, what I saw as key experiment that would move it forward and then a new puzzle would arise and you'd have to come at it with a different angle and you'd get another insight and then another puzzle and uh, or an unexpected direction. Right. Yeah, so trying to hope that I could convey something about how science was actually done and how it felt at the time because I don't know, there's some wonderful young scientists here and they're going to be doing things we can't predict, but I'm sure they will experience all of the same <laughs> things that everybody yeah. else does as they go along. So okay. I was trying to pass on some of my experience anyway. Nice. Well, I think it went down well. To my next questions are ones I just try and ask as many microbiologists as possible. Uh, and the first one is, what's your favorite microbe and why? Well, I don't, I mean, it's the ones you work on, I guess. I've worked on, I started with Salmonella in Bruce Ames lab. That was where I went as an organic chemist, basically nucleic acid or uh, organic chemist, went to learn microbiology. A little bit with Salmonella initially, but for the problems I was addressing with the SOS, the interesting mutants were in E. coli. So that's what I've worked on all my career. But then while I was a postdoc in the mid seventies and I was at Berkeley, recombinant DNA was developed across the Bay in Herb Boyer's lab and Stan Cohen's lab. And at the same moment, transposons became a, a, a thing. And I could see that even organic chemists could use those tools to take any bacterium and make a system that was very much like E. coli in terms of what you could do genetically. So at that point, I thought, well, I should pick something that does something interesting. And I started to work on rhizobium because I did the symbiosis with the plant. But it was, for me, it was, it wasn't, I wasn't intrinsically trying to solve some problem of nodulation. I just saw that you could ask the same level of detailed genetic questions okay. in some other organism, and I've worked with rhizobium, so all kinds of bacteria. Are well, I love that most of my are like, I don't have one, don't make me pick just one, it's too yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the problem I'm interested in, yeah. and okay. then sometimes they're diff same solution, other bacteria, sometimes different solutions, and I, I talk, I think I was talking to some students at lunch about when I was working on, I haven't talked about it here particularly, but on the rhizobium symbiosis, and I found genes that were necessary for the bacterium to live inside of a eukaryotic membrane compartment inside of the plant cells, inside the nodule, which is where it fixes nitrogen. And it's an alpha proteobacterium, and it's very closely related to Brucella, Brucella bordis and other uh, species that live inside of an, a membrane compartment inside of a eukaryotic uh, animal or mammalian cell. And I thought, when we found a gene that was critically required in rhizobium, maybe it was needed by brucella, which might have seemed like a crazy thing, but it turned out a gene needed for chronic infection by rhizobium was needed for chronic infection in brucella. So there, one sort of an experiment in one organism triggered an interest in another that I'd yeah. never worked on, and okay. I had to get a collaborator, but it, it worked out. Sounds cool, like a fun, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, well, so my second question then is, you can't do science without people. so. What's your microbiological, well, who is your microbiological hero and why? And they could be someone you know or don't know, but anyone particular who struck you as someone you'd like to give an accolade to? Uh, I, there were a number of influences. Um, my first powerful one was my postdoc mentor, Bruce Ames. And I was a grad student in Illinois. I heard him give a seminar and I was, at that point, getting conversant with nucleic acid chemistry and a bit with nucleic acid biochemistry. 
but I could see, I, I thought when I heard him talk, I said, he knows how to think like a cell. And I was drawn to him, not only because of the science he'd done, but I wanted to sort of learn to, if I could somehow grasp how to think physiologically and not just learn yeah. genetics. And then when I came to MIT, I was very powerful. There were a number of excellent microbiologists from um, Boris Magasanik who worked on nitrogen metabolism, uh, Salvador Luria, my colleague, uh, Nobel Prize winner, founder of our cancer center, and, uh, Maury Fox, who's very, very thoughtful about DNA repair, and David Botstein, who was a huge influence on me. He was a bundle of enthusiasm about all things genetic. So I think those in particular, and then other, along the way, other, that I could keep going for probably an hour, right. but Just the people who influenced people. me, so it was never one single person, because they sort of drifted into it and yeah. from a different kind of chemical training, and then I, I still to this day have people that I get excited by and I learn things from. Okay. Well, I'm glad there's many, at least. Oh, there's many. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so my final question then is, uh, what one piece of microbiological knowledge should the whole world know about? If you could somehow make everyone understand one fact or one piece of descriptive knowledge about microbiology, what would you, what would you pick? Well, I, I guess I've done a lot of teaching and a lot of interacting with lay folks. And I, I think it's probably better known now than it was a few years ago. But for many people, the only thing they knew was that bacteria made you sick and you took an antibiotic and killed them and they went away. They had no sense of how many bacteria we have in our intestine, what an astonishing number that we're covered with bacteria, that they're absolutely everywhere. Uh, the microbiome, you know, is an influence on all kinds of factors of health. And I think uh, that part of uh, it is now better understood now, but I think there are many people, uh, you know, the world I live in is probably heavily still populated by people who have some amount of education. I think there are a lot of people who don't understand there's this unseen world out there. And the other thing for me that was important, I think, was that that's so much of evolution happened at the level of bacteria. Their first life 3.8 billion years ago, and eukaryotes didn't come around for a long time. so. It's not surprising that amino acid biosynthesis and principles of DNA replication and translation and ribosomes and everything were all worked out in, in bacteria. And I found it fascinating that, you know, especially in the earlier parts of my career, things like DNA repair and stuff like that, that the counterparts were either there directly as homologs in mammalian eukaryotic cells or there was convergent evolution and come to the same solution, but using a different protein or something. But the power of the bacterium is a model for other things. And both Miro and I did work with mismatch repair. I sort of got mutants in MUTES and MUTEL, which are key components of the post-replicative mismatch repair system that improves fidelity after DNA replication. And when I cloned them, um, I tried to publish it back to back. I contacted a group who I thought had the same group, gene. It was called Hex A, but from Streptococcus pneumoniae. And we could see there were homologs. And I tried to publish it, I think, in PNAS. And the reviewers said this was of absolutely no interest. It should go in a specialty journal. So we published it in Journal of Bacteriology. The sequence came out, and my phone started to ring by people who were calling me to tell me that mammalian cells had a mutes homolog. Ironically, one of them was located, I think, on the other side, right beside di um, dihydrofolate reductase. And in the old days, we didn't know so much about DNA, so they'd sequenced in the wrong direction initially, and they had an, an ORF of unknown function. And, and since then, people went on. Within about a year, or less than two years, people had understood that hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, which is now known as Lynch syndrome, or the familial susceptibility to colon, probably ovarian cancer, comes about 
in some cases by defects in the mismatch repair system and you accumulate mutations at a, a much higher rate. And that was a case where the work in bacteria directly informed the, our understanding of humans. So that was the other sort of aspect, microbes as microbes and their role in that, but also microbes as model systems to understand so, yeah, what happened themselves. in evolution and okay. gain insights into humans too. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks a lot for spending some time talking to me. And I uh, hope the rest of the summer school goes well. And, oh, thank uh, you. I think it's a terrifically exciting idea. I'm yeah. spending time with the postdocs, and they're, they're just wonderful. And, uh, well, let's hope we get so to another one. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you.